thing like hugging it a little close. That's okay. <laughs> Oh, sure. Hi, Frank. How are we doing with the tea bags? Anybody know? Oh, there's a huge pile out there. Oh, good. It's but we, huge. We probably still need some. I would say it's still yeah. out there. Okay. I'm watching them, <laughs> waiting. <laughs> Do you know if anybody bought the last four boxes of candy last week? The last four boxes? Wendy, did you get them? Did you the buy last the last four, four? boxes? Okay, there are four boxes left, I think, then, in the office, if anybody's interested. After four down, four down. Hi, Kenny. <laughs> I was over at White House yesterday to get a few things at home. Their poinsettias are gorgeous. Are they year. beautiful? Oh, I can't wait. I'm picking yeah. them up Saturday. Yeah, so, they're yeah. beautiful. That's yeah. great. Yeah. They've got beautiful stuff all year. Do you remember Kathy from the post office in Moncton? Oh, yeah. She works at White House now. Oh, she does? Yeah, so you might see her. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. She's so nice. I know. Good morning and welcome to Moncton Church on this third Sunday in Advent. It's a beautiful day. Uh, we're going to start with surely the presence of the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. And I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. A couple of announcements this morning. Um, the UMW is asking for help in supporting Manor House. Um, this is a really difficult time for the homeless, the hungry. Uh, and we would like to sponsor a breakfast for Manor House again. We've done, done, done that in the past. And it's $500 to sponsor. The UMW has about $250 to put toward it. And we're asking for you to help make up the difference. There's a basket over there. And for those of you online, you could send a donation and just mark it uh, Man House. That would be great. Um, the food bank, thanks for your continued support there as well. Uh, we're also we're still collecting the tea bags, the boxes of 100 tea bags for the Christmas boxes. We're doing great. Thank you to everybody who's brought them so far. Uh, we still need a few more, I believe. So please bring those. We need 14 more. Thank you. Um, the Tuesday Bible study continues at Casamia at 11 and on Zoom. You can find the link in the weekly email from Pastor Bruce. If you use the hymnal in the bag in your pew, please leave it on the pew when uh, you leave today. And finally, please continue to um, support the church with your gifts. Um, you can mail them to the address in the bulletin uh, or put them in the plates.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the reading of the call to worship, Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy, those who go forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Advent candle. The uh, opening hymn this morning is page 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, stand if you were able. Oops, I'm sorry, yeah. verses five, five through six. seven. Yes. I missed that part. Mm -hmm. okay. Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, desire of nations mine, all peoples in one heart and mind. From dust thou brought us forth to light, deliver us from earthly strife. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You can remain standing for the unison prayer that's in your bulletin. Holy and compassionate God, your faithfulness in all things produces the harvest of our joy. We rejoice in you always. Even in our seasons of doubt and darkness, we can find joy in the presence of Christ in our neighbors and the witness of the Holy Spirit in creation. Stir up our holy joy that we may share it with all whom we encounter. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. We want everything to look nice, the decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it's tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. 
We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season, not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Please be seated. First off, I want to apologize to our online viewers today. Apparently, we're having a problem connecting to Facebook. We solved the problem with recordings, and now we're having Facebook problems. So we'll deal with that later, but there will be a recording posted uh, early this afternoon, and we'll send out an email telling people it's there. So we'll get there yet. We'll get there yet. This is the time in our service when we celebrate God with us, Emmanuel. Where have you seen God at work this week, my friends? And how about this beautiful day? You want to, want to start with that? Okay. Several, yes. Wonderful weather. I don't know what the flowers are going to do. I'm, I'm starting to see spring flowers popping up in my garden already. So, And it's not even Christmas yet. But. Uh, little, little green shoots coming up, so, but it is a beautiful day. Where, what else have you seen? Wendy? I can't remember where we are in the saga, but, um, in the but uh, anyway, this was a good week because the appraisal came back to the full home. So I was down to the Well, Wendy sees God in, in, in the work of an appraisal that came back, uh, came back at full value, and she's moving forward. She's moving forward, yes. Where else, my friends? Okay, uh, we'll start with Barb. Her hand was first, then Jenny. <laughs> Okay. Barb sees joy in her neighborhood where people are decorating for Christmas like they probably haven't in a long time. Exactly. Or ever. Or ever. Ever. So last I heard, John, I think you were going down to the store to get batteries for 38 oh. candles or something. <laughs> Plus a battery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Jenny. <laughs> Jenny. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. And we'll give thanks for your negative test. Well, with, with, for Mike's, Mike's, and and we'll give thanks for and we'll give thanks for uh, Bill's negative test as well last Sunday after he, after he traveled back from Florida. You studied hard for your <laughs> test, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are there others? Well, I was thinking the guy fighting how and we sent the word out. I think it was Wednesday for our um, uh, child for the food bank. We we fulfilled that. Um, we heard the call, and it was. I had a great time shopping on Friday. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that because you, you, you can't see it on the camera, but to, you know, when you're in church, take a, goes in church, take a look at the at this front pew here, and uh, and it is a God sighting. This is a very generous congregation, and we really appreciate uh, all the gifts for uh, this child, a member of one of the food bank families. 
Are there others? Well, I have one. I have one. We, this is a joy more than a, well, it's God sighting, but we had our fifth great grandchild uh, earlier this week. A little boy named Jesse. I had to say boy named Jesse because that could go either way. Um, but, uh, and he's, everybody's doing fine. So he and his cousins are going to have a great time down there in Delaware. So, are there others? Well, we have a prayer list. We ask for continued prayers for Lyle and for Judy and Reed and Wendy and Libby, the other Wendy, yes, and Lisa and Jenny and I guess John, your brother and brother in law's. Yeah. A terrible time for people in, in these communities where they can't they can't have visitors yeah so pray for John and all of the people in these communities that are feeling lonely and, and isolated in this holiday season and for Pat White pray, pray for Pat White are there others then let us go to the Lord his name is Leon Liam. <laughs> no. I pray for Liam and George and all and your friends and and all of those who are suffering from this terrible disease. And let's give thanks that uh, the the vaccinations will be will be starting tomorrow, I guess. Are there others? Oh, Joyce. Okay, her name is. Her name is. Jan. Jan? Yeah. We'll pray for Jan, who's in rehab, uh, and she continues to heal. Yes. Are there others? Then let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious healing God, God of this season and God of all seasons, we come to you today to worship, to praise, to sing, to search your word, to wait. We wait today on this third Sunday of Advent with joy, with happiness, as we anticipate Emmanuel, God with us. So continue to touch each of those named here today, each of those listed here today, as they go forth, heal those who are sick, comfort those who are worried and hurting in mind or soul. Be with each one of us. Be with those who are administering this vaccine that will speed us along the road to beating this pandemic. Be with each one. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who when he was here, told us to pray with words like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please join in the prayer for illumination. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. First reading is from the prophet Isaiah, who is reassuring the people of Jerusalem that God will fulfill his promise. The sovereign Lord has filled me with his spirit. He has chosen me and sent me to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce release to captives and freedom to those in prison. He has sent me to proclaim that the time has come when the Lord will save his people and defeat their enemies. He has sent me to comfort all who mourn, to give to those who mourn in Zion joy and gladness instead of grief, a song of praise instead of sorrow. They will be like trees that the Lord himself has planted, and they will all do what is right, and God will be praised for what he has done. They will rebuild cities that have long been in ruins. The Lord says, I love justice and I hate oppression and crime. I will faithfully reward my people and make an eternal covenant with them. They will be famous among the nations. Everyone who sees them will know that they are a people whom I have blessed. Jerusalem rejoices because of what the Lord has done. She is like a bride dressed for her wedding. God has clothed her with salvation and victory. And surely as seeds sprout and grow, the sovereign Lord will save his people and all the nations will praise him. The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24. Be joyful always, pray at all times, be thankful in all circumstances. This is what God wants from you in your life, in union with Christ Jesus. Do not restrain the Holy Spirit, do not despise inspired messages. Put all things to the test, keep what is good, and avoid every kind of evil. May the God who gives us peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body, free from every fault at the company of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you will do it, because he is faithful. Our next hymn is number 160, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Rejoice, ye pure in heart. Rejoice, give thanks, and sing. Your glorious banner wave on high, the cross of Christ, your King. Rejoice, 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 give thanks, and sing. Your clear hosannas raise, and alleluia's loud, while answering echoes upward float like wreaths of incense cloud. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. Yes, on through life's long path, still chanting as you go, from youth to age, by night and day, in gladness and in woe. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. At last the march shall end, the wearied ones shall rest, the pilgrims find their heavenly home, Jerusalem the blessed. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. Praise God who reigns on high, the Lord whom we adore, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God forevermore. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. The Gospel lesson today 
is from John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the one, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. And then, and why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. you pray with me, please? God of hope, you guide us home from the exile of selfish oppression to the freedom of justice, to the balm of healing, to the joy of sharing. Strengthen us to join in your holy work as friends of strangers, as friends of victims, as companions of those whom others shun and as the happiness of those whose hearts are broken. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Joy. Joy to each of you on this third Sunday of Advent. We've lit, lit the pink candle. The, some people call it the mother candle, the joy candle of Advent. You know, originally, Advent was a penitential season time of prayer and penance and sacrifice and fasting. And the third Sunday was designated as a little bit of a break from that. That's why it's a pink candle uh, from those penitential themes, emphasizing the joy of the coming of the Lord. Joy. Joy is something we heard in the proclamation from Isaiah, which Chuck read a few minutes ago. We're spending some time this Advent with Isaiah. Last week we talked about the way home and we envisioned a God who will bring us home and will be our home. And we're going to go back to Isaiah again today, but not to the same Isaiah we heard last week. As you probably know, Isaiah, which is one of the longest books in the Bible, was written by at least, at least I say, three different authors at different times in Israel's history. It was a long stretch of years during which those people use, using the pen name Isaiah recorded what we read there. But the books are all related to each other. 
Last week we heard a passage to the, written to the Hebrew people while they were in exile in Babylon. It came from the 40th chapter, what's, what the scholars call part of Deutero Isaiah, the second part of the three book trilogy. This morning Chuck read from the 61st chapter, which was not written to people living in captivity, but people who had already returned, who had been liberated from that captivity and returned home. And they were living the dream that their parents and grandparents had dreamed for generations. But once they made it back to Israel, it wasn't the Disney World landscape that had been imagined. The people who were back home had never really actually been there for the most part. They had heard tales of it passed down from the generations from their parents and grandparents, great-grandparents, those who had once lived there before the exile. And the memories that those ancestors had shared, well, let's say they were probably a bit exaggerated or at least seen through rose-colored glasses. I think we all probably have that tendency, don't we? To look back on the good old days, make our childhoods larger and grander than they were. We remember a house. It was, oh, a mansion for us. More than enough for our family. And the woods out back, a forest, the deep forest that we explored. And just the wonderful, all the wonderful things that we remember in our mind's eye. But then we go back. We go back home and eh, the house is nice enough. The forest, well, actually there's a development behind it. <laughs> you know? And we see something different than what we remember. Reality and remembrance are not always the same. So it was for those Israelites once they returned home. In fact, it was worse because during the exile, things had fallen into disrepair. Houses that had stood unoccupied will do what houses that stand unoccupied will do. They had deteriorated. The temple had been destroyed. Isaiah describes it this way, and I'm quoting. The ancient ruins, the places long devastated, the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations even in their liberation from exile in Babylon, the people of Israel face challenges of monumental proportion. They had to make things right again to make it feel like home. And they needed a guide. They needed some way to get there, somebody to lead them. So whether the topic in our lives as relationships or our work, our physical conditioning, re-entering the workplace after an extended absence, a lot of people are facing that, rebuilding a business or a church, a host of other endeavors, endeavors, going back home is not like riding a bicycle. You don't just hop up on it and begin to pedal. The Israelites returned home, there was work to be done. And yet, they wanted to make things right. And this is the news of great joy. They didn't have to rely solely on their own strength to correct that what had, go what had gone wrong. They were given the promise that someone was gonna come to them who would guide them who would guide them on the journey, help them do the heavy lifting, at least in the spiritual or emotional sense. God would send someone who would say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, to announce that the year of the Lord's favor had come, to provide comfort to all who mourn, and to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of a crown of ashes, and the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. It would be centuries 
could be a long time. But God keeps God's promises. That message of hope carried the people of Israel through because they were going to get a guide. And when that guide came and he returned to his hometown of Nazareth and led worship in the synagogue there, his sermon that day was clear and concise and to the point. He simply read that passage from Isaiah and said, Today, these words have been fulfilled in your hearing. Advent is a season when we look forward to the arrival of that special someone who God is sending to guide us into the right kind of life. But, but then there's this. The biblical truth is that God doesn't force himself on us. We read in Revelation that God simply stands at the door and knocks. We have to decide whether or not to accept grace, whether to open that door and the guidance God offers to provide. These are troubled times. I don't have to tell you that. These are troubled times in our world, in our country, in our communities. I find it interesting, at least in this country, that those who govern over us, over us politically are overwhelmingly professing to be Christians. What's that word mean? To be like Christ, right? To follow Christ. I sometimes, and I did this when I was working in Washington with him, yes, you can ask before you ask. I sometimes fantasize about what it would be like if these people in power who say they believe in Jesus suddenly found the courage to follow him. Not just to acknowledge him and go to church and give a political speech, but take Jesus' word and stand it in stark contrast to partisan loyalties. What would our country look like? If people in power who claim to be Christians would courageously and consistently practice what they profess. Before we get too high and mighty, what would it look like if churches did the same? Wouldn't it be exciting to witness what it means to rebuild the ruins, as Isaiah put it? To see what would happen if we radically, dramatically began to actually practice what we preach. What miracles could the faith community see if we did that? And in our own personal lives, what potential remains untapped if we're determined to create our own dreams and forge our own paths without ever consulting the one who stands at the door and knocks? Are we ready to open that door to that one? The worrying thing is that there, these are logical arguments. And they come out maybe sometimes out of an act of desperation. Things are tough out there. We read every day of a, another company going out of business, other people being unemployed and layoffs, another sign of shutdowns hurting. The front page is just full of disheartening news. Desperation sometimes calls for desperate solutions. Not solutions of desperation, but solutions of faith. Isaiah, Isaiah understood that. It was going to be hundreds of years before the one that Isaiah prophesied would come. But come, he was. He was coming. See, Isaiah, the authors of Isaiah wrote in two different worlds. And Isaiah, the first part of Isaiah is, is not going so well. There, there was a mode of judgment and warning. And then in the middle, in the middle we have this exile. And then in the reading today, we return to joy. So you have this kind of joy Sadness, joy. He's saying, look at, look at one another. Look what you're doing to each other. Look at how you're living. Look at the source of your worth. Look at, well, 
Look at the foundations of your society. Does your, what you're doing reflect your status as the people of God? The second half of the book speaks to desperate people. That middle part speaks to desperate people who have lost all, who are hungry and afraid and homeless. They're refugees. And then, again this morning, there's a word of hope. It's a promise. A promise that even in desperate times, even when things are in ruins, God is going to send one who would say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, and to announce that the day of the Lord's favor, to provide comfort for all who mourn. Jesus said today, these words have been fulfilled in your presence. So we have some hard work ahead of us. We have some hard work ahead of us to make these things right. We've allowed things to go wrong for too long. But God is sending someone. God has sent someone. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to, again, celebrate that arrival. Going to send that one. And in our gospel lesson today, John, John repeats that word of hope. Actually, both Johns do. John the Gospel writer and John the Baptist, both. But John knows that the only way to look is to look beyond John the Baptist. He's presented as somebody who is to point the way to someone greater than himself who comes. There was a man sent from God his, whose name was John. He came as a witness to, te a witness to testify to the light. He, he himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. Temptation is always going to be there to keep our expectations locked away in that manger. Keep that, our hopes kind of in a dream world of Christmas cards and Christmas carols. But God sent one who brings his own agenda. God sent one who has his own building plan. And sometimes that means the plans that we made have to be modified or even thrown out altogether. There's a saying, you've probably heard it. If you want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. We have to set our plans aside. We have to set our plans aside because ultimately only doing what God wants will bring us life. Will you pray with me, please? God of fresh starts and second chances, move again into our world. Come into our world through the miracle of incarnation and open our ears and hearts and minds to the counsel of Christ that we might make life right again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am now going to dedicate the offering.
The dedication hymn today is one of our favorites to usher in the Christmas season. Hark the Herald Angels Sing on page 240 in the hymnal. And this one really should be sung, but it's not going to be. But stand up as though you're going to sing it with gusto. Hum quietly for your <laughs> Yes, hum. <laughs> Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all, ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that we no more may die. Born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. It is so hard not to sing those songs, isn't it? It really, really is. But in the name of Jesus the Christ, we care for each other. We are doing everything we can to keep not just ourselves, but our whole community safe. So for this season, this season will bear with that and look for joy when we can sing in the future. But it's hard, I'm going to tell you. I got to tell you, a couple of weeks ago, Pat caught me singing when I shouldn't have been up here. I heard about it. <laughs> and now, my friends, go in peace. Go in joy. Go to love and care for one another in the name of Christ. And may God the Creator bless you richly. May Christ the Son pour his riches on each of you. And may the Holy Spirit comfort and support and lead us in the paths of hope and of peace and of joy and of love. Now and forevermore, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>